are live. I guess I should say in English first. What would you like, I think, would be the most. Yes, so, what would you like from 1956? Thoughts? 1956 film. In Danish, it is called Vevity Hay. Now, I am gonna... There it is. So, first of all, I want to say a quick message about Corona. I hope you and your loved ones are safe. Please take action to avoid infection, or if infected, try to avoid infecting others. Do not panic. Governments around the world are taking action to handle the situation. Not all of them are doing an equally good job, but panicking is not going to solve anything. And please do not listen to those spreading misinformation. So, back to the movie. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the first section via the description box. So, this contains spoilers. And the reason I say the year this came out and that it's a film is because it's not very well known. And I want you to know what it is before you start watching a lot of this video thinking it's less obscure if you're simply not interested in, in the subject. I don't blame anyone for not being. If I didn't already care about this thing from having watched it, I don't know, I guess the... Since childhood, I've probably watched it at least a dozen times, maybe a couple dozen. And yeah, I was very happy to find that the VHS copy of it had not been lost somewhere as a number of other movies that me and my father have bought have ended up doing. So, this is not a review, this is a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is jokes, etc. Thoughts that I had while watching, those in chronological order, as well as before watching, separated into the first two sections, time codes in the description box, and then in the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, IMDb, and Wikipedia. And before recording this vlog, I read all of it, and some of it I read, you know, weeks ago, so some of it I don't remember completely. Now, if you're not interested in the content of all three sections, I invite you to only watch the ones you are interested in. Now. But yeah, the... Basically, I'm not... I am basically going to describe the contents of this without, you know, the, the, like, if you watch this and you feel like, well, that sounds interesting, that sounds like something I might like, I'm not going to give so much away that there's no longer any enjoyment in watching it. Now... When I talk about the quality of what I'm doing the video on, I try to strike a good balance between being appreciative of both intentions and results, criticizing things I genuinely feel should be criticized, and I try to judge the subject on its own terms. If it's just trying to be entertaining, is it entertaining? If it's trying to be smart, is it etc. You know, by today's standards, there's not that much in this that, yeah, that lives up to today's standards. Even for, I mean, the, the back of the VHS cover calls it a f farce. It also says it's 98 minutes, which is 20 minutes more than what it actually is. It, even with previews, it's nowhere near that long. I don't know. I, I don't know. I guess they looked at the number that someone had noted that it was, and they were like, there's no way it's that short. It's got to be like off by 20 minutes or something. I, d I believe there are other movies from that time that are under, you know, yeah, it's it's 78 minutes if you don't count the end credits, 80 if you do count them. So, let's see. Now, this, yeah, I, I didn't spend any money on this. It was something that most likely my 
father bought when I was a child. So anything negative by saying this video is not out of bitterness. So let's see. Yeah, if I had to guess, the first time I watched this was probably. Let's see. I guess. I think they're probably not quite 30 years, but that's probably that number probably isn't off by very much. And let's see. So yeah. Since this movie has probably not been seen by all that many people worldwide compared to many of the other movies I talk about, I'm going to try to describe what's in this movie so that it doesn't sound confusing to those who haven't watched it yet, and so that you can gauge, I mean, no one's going to buy this on VHS today. I don't know if it's on DVD, possibly, but yeah, basically, I... The first section of this video, I'm going to try to give you an idea of what you would be paying for if you buy this, if you buy a copy of this today. But do not make this the first thing you've seen from the 50s. And, you know, and, and definitely don't make it the first thing you see by these performers. They've done more substantial material, you know, in, in other movies. This is basically, if you really like Danish movies from that time period and these performers, you know, you might enjoy it. I mean, you know, like I mentioned, my father bought this. I'm not certain if he watched it when he was young, when it first came out, but the... Uh, certainly he watched a lot of the other material of several of the performers. And they, yeah, basically, you know, and, and he had seen things from back then. He had, he did watch things back then. So, let's see. So, my own quote-unquote film critic rating for this. If you go by the standards of the time... A 7 out of 10. My personal rating is an 8 out of 10. I really, you know, if I watched it for the first time today, maybe it would be lower. If I didn't have any kind of emotion, like, if this was the first time I saw these performers, this really wouldn't mean very much. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. When you see, when you recognize a performer, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I really like them in this and that other thing. So it's, yeah. Okay, and that brings us to the first section. Notes taken while watching. So before I get more into detail, the humor is verbal, physical, corny, and goofy, and there are jokes about male-female relationships, sex, family relationships, certain kinds of jobs and situations. It's, it's fairly varied, but it is all f the kind of humor that you would see back then in stuff from this time. And, I, yeah, let me briefly... Basically, I don't think I'm going to make... Let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to pronounce these names in Danish. I... Yeah, I, I don't... It's just going to be awkward if I try to... I, I don't even know how, you know... How, how these names would be pronounced in English. I don't think I've ever heard them pronounced in English. But as a brief... The, the two stars are Dirk Pesa and Kjell Petersen. And the former more than the latter, 
if you haven't watched anything with them, I would say they're fairly com comparable to the the kind of stuff that Jim Carrey did in the 90s. You know, uh, the, the kind of like broad kind of, of physical humor and yeah, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, you know what, I'm just gonna start by straight up reading. Okay, so yeah, just there's not a lot of stuff on the cover, so this isn't gonna take long. Yeah, so this is the greatest, yeah, the biggest Danish movie ever produced. 32 popular actors, and let's see, yeah. So yeah, I'm just gonna list off. These are, yeah, these are probably the most famous names from it. Gustav Larsen, Bruce Bowie, Paul Hain, Max Hansen, Marguerite Vibu, sorry. Ole Monchi, Preben Mart, Bodil Steen, Birgitte Reimer. And the, let's see. Yeah, basically, that is, yeah, so, the movie opens with joke credits that would make Deadpool blush. So, the, the first scene is the two screenwriters, Dirk Pesa and Kel Peterson, and the, basically their names are slightly, you know, I think... Uh, yes, I, I believe Dirk Pesa becomes Dirksen, Kel Peterson becomes Kelsen. So basically, Kel Peterson, they they just, yeah, you know, they added the the last three letters of his last name to his first name, and you know, with Dirk Pesa, they took those last and and you know, son means in Danish exactly what it means in English, son of. But but yeah, the two screenwriters and the director. I don't know if I know who the director is played by. They're being told by, I mean, they they call him the director of the company, but I don't, is he supposed to be the producer? I, I don't know exactly, but the let's go with company only. They have two days left before they have to start shooting, but they don't have any of the script. So, you know, they, yeah, they have these two days left to ask basically every different type of audience member what they want and get some material for every single one of them for the movie so that there is something in there that will appeal to everyone which I mean it's pretty incredible how accurate this actually is to like movies today where there is all kinds of stuff in there and it's like okay so clearly that was there because they wanted to pander to a certain audience. I they probably had no idea how accurate it was going to be. They they probably just thought wouldn't that be silly if someone actually put stuff in I mean if there is one sort of central thematic joke to the movie it is definitely there's no way to appeal to all of these different people. You know, basically it's a series of sketches and very clearly the sketches are each written with you know very specific people in mind and yeah and and that's the thing again please don't make this the first danish comedy from the the this time period that you see because most of them are more not all of them are substantial but there are very few that are this unfocused. You know, they tend to have a specific plot, a set of characters. You know, honestly, Danish comedies from the time are not that dissimilar from American comedies from the time. There are definitely some differences. I honestly don't think I've watched enough American comedies from the time to properly explain, describe the differences. But based on the ones I've seen, it's there. There are a lot of similar, you know. There are a couple of cultural difference-based differences, you know. 
as as much as Denmark is always trying to copy American culture, there there's stuff that we didn't take. Now, let's see. And they're actually in that first scene. There's a joke about. There's there are several jokes about how, if you pay someone to write something. The like. They will they will keep postponing doing it, and you know they'll spend the money. They'll maybe ask for more money to write it. I had no idea when I first watched. You know. I watched it just before starting to watch, starting to record. It's been years since I last watched it, and in those years, I've heard Lindsay Ellis joke numerous times that writers of books and plays and movies always ask for a lot of money up front, spend the money, and then postpone starting to write. When I first watched this, I had no idea that that was an accurate thing, but apparently. But yes, you know, we get a lot of scenes of them having to adapt to talking to the various people. You know, some of them the, will only talk to them under very specific circumstances. And over the course of the people, we'll see, so the movie, we'll see clips of what, of what the movie they're making would end up looking like. So very meta. So let's see. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be quoting that many of the individual jokes. Let's see. So, yeah, the first that they talk to is an eight-year-old girl. And she asks for, you know, she wants for the movie to have her dolls performing. And it's actually a little weird that they start with that because it's one of the only ones that doesn't lead into any kind of sketch or joke. And it's like, eesh. basically they thought, well, that is what an eight-year-old girl would want to, to have in, the, in a movie. I don't know, I guess it's possible one of them has Ed, an eight-year-old, you know, who by now would no longer be eight, obviously, had an eight-year-old girl and asked, and that was the, the response they got. But And they certainly do get some jokes out of, you know, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna I'm gonna quote any of them, but they they get some jokes out of you know what would an eight year old girl say if you asked her what she wants in a movie and but but yeah, for some reason they started with that even though it's one of the only it kind of it doesn't really set up the expectations for the rest of the movie all that well because it's one of the only times where. Come to think of it, it might be the only time where they talk to a person about what they want in a movie and it doesn't lead into a few minute sketch of, you know, basically what it would look like if that thing was in the movie. You know, for the, for the rest of it, I, I honestly don't know for sure because I've only seen them you know, collected on VHS and DVD. I guess a lot of them were put on TV or something, but some of these performers did do a lot of sketch comedy in, you know, the 50s and 60s and so. And I think this is the only movie that has, like, there, there are a couple of the other ones where there'll be, like, a scene. Okay, that's a sketch, you know, like, Ah, let me think. Three men on a raft. I think it would be called in English. Which is on YouTube. Nobody remembers that that's actually from a movie. Nobody remembers what movie that's from. And I don't even right now remember, you know, but everyone that, you know, not everyone my age, but everyone you know, who has a family member my dad's age has seen that sketch and loves it because it's amazing, but nobody remembers that that's actually a scene from an actual movie because the rest of that movie 
it's, it's fine, but it's nothing groundbreaking, but that sketch is amazing, you know, and that is, it's, it's some of the movies, it's like with the Monty Python movies, they are a series of sketches that are more or less related to each other. But this is the only one where it's so vague. These are, you know, they don't have the same characters in them. They, some of them have the same performers in them. You know, in addition to the, the uh, playing the two screenwriters, De Pesa and Kelpidesen appear in some of these sketches outside of playing the role, you know, and then a lot of the sketches are other characters. And they're really, there is, nothing tying this together other than the idea that basically we're seeing the movie being imagined you know they're they're yeah they're they're imagining what the movie would end up being or i guess we're getting a glimpse of what the event you know they're it's not this is not one of the movies where it then ends with showing what the actual movie that, you know, that there, there are movies that are about making a movie, and then at the end of it, you'll see what the movie would end up looking like, or something, you know. Uh, off the top of my head, what's it called? America's Sweetheart, I want to say it's called. You see clips from the movies that the, the two are in, in, during that movie, you know. This is basically, there, uh, it doesn't completely make sense for it to be the actual scenes and certainly if they are the the movie they're making is just there's there's nothing tying it together at all it's just a series of sketches that are completely unrelated to each other you know at least in this movie in not the movie they're making but this movie specifically there is the red th th ah sorry what's that called in english see not being multilingual isn't always as easy as sometimes it maybe looks. Because I gotta remember not to... My audience for this video will be even smaller if I do actually speak Danish very much of it. So, it's only gonna be for the names. Let me think. The, the connecting... Yeah, the, there's not very much connecting this movie, but what little there is is that there's at least that, you know, the con the thing that connects us all, connects it all, is the, 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 the inherently ridiculous concept of making a movie that appeals to every single group, you know, in, in a, yeah, so far I've only mentioned eight-year-old girl, there's also a diver, a couple of sailors, a 17-year-old girl, uh, you know, various, let's see, a, a royal guard, I think it's called, you know, these are, these are such completely different, you know, people with completely different ideas, although several of them do say they really want to see half-naked women, but it's, anyway, the, the, which the movie's happy to oblige. But the actual, you know, the movie they're making would make no sense if these are, yeah, if these are the scenes, there's nothing connecting them. It's just a series of completely unconnected, you know. But yeah, I'm sure that whoever came up with this idea, you know, I guess they didn't high-five back then. They, they patted themselves on the back and they were like, everybody loves sketches with these people. I'm just going to make a movie that's nothing but sketches. And it's just barely justified at all. But, like I said, if, if you enjoy the sketch comedy, then it's quite entertaining. And at 78 minutes, you know, it's a, it's a quick sit. It's not something that's going to eat up your whole day. So, let's see. Right, and yeah, one of them, one of the, the screenwriters goes to talk to, to some sailors and you know you have the really obvious joke that they're supposed to go around asking what would you like of all these different people so he goes up to these two sailors who don't know who he is and he says what would you like 
and obviously, you know, they 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 don't understand his meaning, so they you know they say two beers. But then the joke is, each, you know. Now, let's see. And yeah, the the just under ten minutes in. The movie has bare-legged dancing girls, maybe a dozen or so, justified by nothing other than the sailor showing he has a tattoo of a woman like that on his belly and says she should be in the movie. You know, but the the excuse me. If I recall, this was a thing that was like that's right, it doesn't say it on the cover. There was a a certain let's see, I mean he didn't only make movies, he also did like uh, stage performances, which these guys also appeared in. They they were ridiculously overworked, but in some of these stage performances also there would be these, you know, not always bare legged, but dancing girls, you know, by, by today's standards, it's tame. But back then it was, you know, I, the, the guy knew his audience, the, let's see. so, let's see, yeah, and Jay Passa is supposed to talk to a 17 year old girl about what she wants to be in the movie. So he's like walking up to like middle aged women on the street and, you know, yeah, asks, Do you know where I could find a 70 year old girl? And one of them straight up, you know, calls out for the police. And to escape her, he ducks into, I had to look this up, what's it called in English? An indoor bath, swim, swimming pool. It's a public place where you can go inside and swim in a pool. It's not like a privately owned swimming pool kind of thing. And anyway, yeah. And there he does find, you know, a 17 year old uh, swimming. So he goes into the water and, you know, he's got, yeah, to, I'm, I'm going to have to just straight up explain. Otherwise it's going to sound. It's not going to make any sense. It doesn't really make sense if you explain it, but this is the kind of humor the movie does sometimes have, you know. He's got a regular pad, pad of paper and a regular pen. And so he's in the water with, you know, the, the obviously the paper and pen are at this point completely, I mean, I guess if he went back on, on land, the pen would possibly still write, but the paper obviously completely ruined. But he, you know, not only is he already, you know, in the water with it soaked, he's like, oh, I, I gotta go underwater because my pen doesn't work. My, my pen only works underwater. And, let's see. yeah, and she apparently likes, like, jazz music kind of thing. So, the, yeah, a Danish band leader starts speaking English with... I don't think an intentional thick accent to introduce a saxophone player who plays jazz like they do in LA. And he does do a pretty good job imitating. I don't, I can't offhand say what kind I jazz musician accent. I don't, I don't know. That might've sounded kind of racist. I don't mean, I mean, the performance is possibly racist. There's no blackface, but I th yeah, it's possible that the people he's imitating are all black and that it comes off as racist because it's a white guy doing it. But he does a pretty good job imitating the accent. And they do play some really good jazz music. And, you know, the good thing about the movie is basically no matter what part of it you're watching, it'll be over within, like, I don't know, three to five minutes. You know, none of these are long. You know, so so this is not something where, like, it's, there's some chance that the next thing you'll like more than the current thing. You know, somewhat like what genre of movie you want to watch while you're watching Venom. 
you know, this is, if you, you know, you, um, one thing to, to avoid, because it really just gets completely mired in the kind of thing, and I don't know, I guess people back then wanted it, but there's a Danish movie called The Green Elevator, Den Grøn Elevator, also with Kjell Peterson, and that movie is just one long series of, it's, it's just, it's actors pretending to be drunk. I, I don't remember the details, but I think it was maybe, they, they made the movie not long after, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure there was ever prohibition in this country, but certainly there, I, th I think what it was, was that the censors used, the censorship used to not allow for people acting drunk in TV and movies. And when the censorship, you know, eased up on that and said, okay, fine, you can act drunk in movies, there was a real appetite for that sort of thing. And they really, they, they put all their money on that because that is the only thing there is in, maybe not the absolute only thing, but it, the amount of screen time of that movie, the percentage of the screen time that is just people acting drunk. I mean, we're not talking like different, you know, sight gags and such. No, it's just people slurring their speech and walking funny. Like, it's as if, like, imagine if the uh, dinner for one, that's what it's called in English. If dinner for one wasn't particularly funny and it went on for like an hour or something, 45 minutes an hour, I think, of that is just people acting drunk. It's, yeah. Anyway. Yes, and the band also do a, a really good job imitating like the body language and facial expressions of jazz musicians. And I think to be fair, like I don't, I don't think they realized that it was kind of racist to really like imitate black people like that. And they're not doing it in a way that makes black people look ridiculous. I, th you know, it's it's important to remember that. You know, Denmark really doesn't have the kind of history with slavery that America does. And thus, I mean, it's not only America, but Den in Denmark, black people were never seen as, I don't know, never is that. I think you have to go very far back before you find a lot of Danes thinking that like, black people are, like, that, that they all conform entirely to stereotypes. And, for example, that they're not as smart as white people. I, I don't think there's a lot of that in, in Danish movies and, and such, even if you go all the way back to the start of, Dan of, of cinema. Now. Yeah, so Dick Passer talks to a, again, I believe it's called Royal Guard. I, Yeah, it's been many, many years since I last had to refer to one of those in English. So anyway, he says he won't let a civilian into the area, only military personnel. So Dick Passer dresses up as like a military, I mean, he basically looks like Napoleon. There's, there's definitely some of that going on. He's got the hat, for example. And he imitates, like, the giving of orders and the body language and yells at the guy and, and thus gets information. And as usual, he does a really great impersonation, you know, the, yeah. And, and obviously part of the humor, I don't know with 100% certainty, but I believe at that time you did have to serve in the military at least a little. I don't think it meant... That you had to, you know, go actually fire a gun at another human being. But I think you had to go through, like, basic training. And then after that, you could have, you know, a job within the military for a short extent of time that did not involve seeing, what's the word, seeing action. You know, that's the, I think that's the phrase term. Anyway, 
not word because it's two. Anyway, however, as such, you know, I, I think this was made before there was any acceptance of women in the military, but it does still mean that does still mean basically every guy in Denmark who was 18 or older had experienced some military, at least training. So obviously seeing, I would say probably the most famous comedian of the time, making fun of that, you know, that was obviously like really relieved some tension for, yeah. And let's see, yeah. And so, you know, the guy wants, he says he wants something macabre and he wants women, preferably naked, and, you know, due to censorship, the, you know, the it's not, it doesn't go further than toplessness, and the, the, yeah, you know, within, like, I, I, I didn't count, but not very many seconds of the, the toplessness goes by before, like a sensor bar shows up to cover the area uh, where the breasts are. Not not specifically. It's not the kind of sh you know like strict sensor bar that only covers exactly. No, it's it's basically like like let's say yeah. There's no way to do this without awkward. But let's say let's say that the the I forget what it's called. But it, uh, yeah, let's say that these are the breasts. It's not like covering, it's more like, you know, co covering like a significant chunk of that area. And the sensor bar looks like lace underwear. And there's written on it, there has to be lace. The sensors, you know, so yeah, as a, as a kind of amusing, you know, and, and that's part of why it covers as much as it does. And it actually, it goes from like one, like, if, if this is the screen, it goes from, you know, it covers the entire screen. So, as if it was actually, they that they put lace over, you know, the, the film negative or something. You know, they, they put, yeah, goofy joke, slightly amusing. And, you know, after some, some seconds, some of the women start appearing in other parts of the frame. You know, within a few seconds, the sensor bar has moved and then says, sorry for moving the lace. And the macabre part is covered by some vocalists. I guess it is just called vocalizing, like like a humming kind of, they're not singing lyrics. You know, no dis discernible, no real discernible lyrics. And again, doesn't go on for, for very long. They're quite good. It It is kind of macabre sounding and there's some physical performance in there that really reminds me of Laurel and Hardy and other parts of the movie has that as well but that's one of the most like there's this gag where one of the guys I think there's like five and you know basically they're arranged so that yeah like if you imagine my, my face is one of them and then there's heads up here and heads down here and one of the heads down here, like, he looks as though, I, I guess the joke is supposed to be that him vocalizing is kind of like the air coming out of a balloon or something. Like, he's he's really winding down as he, and, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, going side to side, and then starts to almost, like, not quite fall over, but, like, slowly... You know, and and then I forget if it's one of the others that that helps get him upright, or if he like suddenly snaps back, or you know, anyway. And and the movie director talks to a woman who runs an advice column, and he keeps trying to cut in. You know, she's basically she's sitting there. First, she reads aloud a letter, and then she dictates the the answer to her secretary and you know he keeps trying to cut in and she keeps like telling him no I, I'm busy you know so eventually he simply writes his question into one in, you know on a piece of paper 
and puts it in on top of the pile of letters and she responds without realizing that she's responding to him and let's see, yeah and we see a clip of the movie that she would want and it's one of those cliches about women talking to each other non-stop with very high-pitched voices and you know they sound and look somewhat like you know chickens and the things they talk about are very superficial you know they fit in all the negative stereotypes and you know basically they're there to visit the husband of one of them in the hospital and they don't seem to care that he's in pain you know they they like sit on the bed that he's trying to relax in you know basically as far as i understand it's basically it's after surgery and you know he's recovering so he needs bed rest and they basically like sit on the bed and and like push him a little in in the bed and sit right up next against him and there's a part where you know they they one of them leans over him and they do like um exercise you know to you know exercises for getting in shape kind of thing the you know in a way that that yeah, it's it's hard to describe. I guess, yeah, yeah. Basically, in a way that you know would be uncomfortable, maybe even painful for him. And then at the end, it turns out, oh, they're actually in you know the room. It's it's the wrong room. And they're like, why didn't you tell us? And he's you know he's been lying there trying to get rest. So it's it's that really obnoxious stereotype that you know women just won't let men get the the rest and you know peace and quiet that they need that we need sorry and let's see Kilby doesn't talk to a housewife and asks how many kids do you have I don't know they refuse to stand still when I try to count them and yeah, she says she basically, she has to be her own housekeeper. And so we see a clip of a wife whose housekeeper just quit. And basically, yeah, and, and the husband keeps blaming her for the housekeeper leaving. And, you know, yeah, basically like blames her for things that she couldn't possibly have prevented. But she does get to object and point out that it's not her fault. You know, I, I would say the, like, the writing is more on her side than on his. It It's basically making him out to look bad. Basically, the scenario is that he's invited two of his friends over, and they can't, you know, it's, the housekeeper just left. You know, it's impossible for them to get in the housekeeper in time, so she has to be the housekeeper instead of the wife. And the two friends immediately start perving over the housekeeper, not knowing that she's the wife. They, they think she's single. And and one of them is Ovis Bowie, Ivan Olsen from Olsen Bend, or the Olsen Gang. I used to know the name of the other one, but I've forgotten. And it's, it's really wild. He has so little screen time that, like, let's see, was he headlining movies? In 1956? I think so. I think he was the star of some. Now. Let's see. And now I'm not sure if I read the next sentence, so I'm just going to read it again. I used to know the name of the other guy who plays one of the friends, but I've forgotten. And the two friends talk about what a horn dog the husband is, not knowing the housekeeper is the wife, and she'll be upset by it, you know. It, it's that stereotype of the man, the moment that the, he, you know, the moment that he, the wife, if he thinks that he can get away with it without his wife finding out about it, he's going to flirt with other women and try to get, you know, basically try to cheat on her. And the wife eventually starts crying and the friends think that she's worried the wife will find out that the husband is a horned dog. And let's see. Yeah, and it, it culminates in the 
you know, crying housekeeper leaving the, the room and the two friends, you know, follow her. There's also this bit uh, slightly earlier where, like, let's see, I, I think the implication is supposed to be that the wife, either she broke something, like, yeah, like, there's a loud crash, so it sounds like a vase was broken, and I'm not 100% certain if the idea is that she smashed it on the floor, or if she, like, tried to hit him with it. He doesn't look like he's just been hit by a vase when he comes back out. So maybe she threw it at him and he ducked in time? I don't know exactly. But that also goes, you know, that stereotype that women get violent in a situation like that. And, you know, play for laughs. When really it's not funny. When it happens in real life. It, anyway. So, but, but yeah, once the, the housekeeper and the friends leave, go into another room, the husband starts singing that people should show more affection for their significant others. He, he refers to it as the 11th commandment after decrying that the first 10 are barely followed. And... And Jake Pazza talks to... I... Uh, I don't know exactly what the name of, the, I, I guess a professional diver, while the person is underwater, through a phone, and then he acts like he gets swim, like, the guy who's not underwater acts as though he get like, he's you know, holding up the phone, and then he's like, ah. like, as if he got swimmer's ear through the phone, and the, and the scene becomes that Jake Paz is playing a sailor who sells books, and... There's various, I mean, basically, they wrote a bunch of, like, excuse me, a bunch of fish puns, you know, puns that combine fish and books and such, and, and some of them are just book puns, like, there's a, ah, I forget if that's only a Danish phrase or if it's also in English, there's, there's a bit about where, like, you know, this is a, a brick novel, and, the, you know, there's there's an actual brick in there, and, yeah. And, and, and a middle-aged woman comes to complain about him selling filth, and they do some, like, record stuck repeating jokes, like, where she keeps, like, trying to point to indicate of a book. And, and saying that filth or something like that. And and she keeps, like, trying to, to like, move move her hand. But she she's, like, stuck. And, and so he, like, takes the, the hand and puts it back. And, like, down in the in the record groove, you know. Yeah, this is really... there There's definitely some stuff in here that you don't get if you don't know technology from when it was made. You know, I... I, I don't know if we still have it, but my dad still had his old record player when I was a kid, so I know exactly what a record player. I, I've I've started and stopped a record player that where you had to put it in the groove or pick it up from the groove and such. So, but some of these jokes for for today's audience, you really need to know. Yeah, and and the director talks to a delivery man, and the delivery man. You know, af after that, the delivery man sings about his job, and th it's supposed to be that he's driving, but it's a really obvious green screen. I, th I think people were probably more forgiving of that back then. I will say the green screen footage itself is not the worst I've seen. Like, if you don't know what you're, if you don't know that you're looking at a green screen, yeah, kids probably thought that they actually did film him while driving. And he sings about how he doesn't want love, only casual sex. By today's standards, these really make men look a lot worse than women, which I think is the opposite of what was intended when they made it. I think you're supposed to laugh at the women and, uh, like, excuse me, feel kinship with the men, basically. And and then, the, you know, the delivery man, he's, he's basically told to go see someone about, uh, I think, stage 
a stage show. And so he, he does, and it's this guy who's got, like, ticks and such, and he starts doing, you know, he, he readies for a performance, and then he does the ticks in time with music. And as far as I understood, it's supposed to be him explaining that he was, like, he was on a train. And, like, the train was, like, ah, what's it called? Like, a, like, rocky kind of, you know. And that gave him ticks. He still, you know, as if his body hasn't quite accepted that it no longer needs to move like that to make up for the rocky train ride, you know. And... I guess I haven't, it's, it's been a little while since I've commented on the quality. Pretty much all of these are pretty well done for what they are, you know. Like today, honestly, I think this movie, I don't think that it's necessarily something no one would watch today. I just think that today, what it should be is a series of YouTube clips where like, you know, yeah, like one account uploads every single scene from this movie individually and like each sketch also has the part leading into it where one of the two screenwriters or the director talks to a person explaining what the bit is supposed to be, you know, so that there's a little context there. I, th I think that would probably be, you know, but, but yeah, these are all like... The, the expectations back then were very different, but yeah, like there's no, the music is not made to be bad music, like to, you know, sometimes there will, in, in fiction, there will be bad music and we're supposed to laugh because it's bad music, but in this, yeah, like it's music that if it wasn't, well, not all of it, it's funny, but the stuff that isn't funny I would like, I would listen to it, you know, without, again, if you like music from that time. And yeah, some of this, it's just people standing there playing music, but it's really good music. And it is, I don't feel like anything was like just phoned in for this movie. I feel like they did put effort into everything and it may not have aged that well. I really need to stop saying that in this video. But it was it was pretty good at the time, considering that the concept is inherently it's a it's taking I feel like it's probably easier to sit down and write a bunch of sketches with vague justification than it is to write a movie where, you know, the characters are consistent from start to finish, and you give them stuff to do. There's stuff to, you know... So, it, it is the, the... Excuse me? Ah, what's the word? It, it is easier. It was easier for them to do this than to, you know, but... With that said, it is, yeah, and I, I mean, sometimes not everything needs a good movie around it. I, I feel bad for people who want to watch very specific things. You know, a lot of movies that are, where it's something that's difficult to write a story around, you know, so they don't get very good movies, and anyway, so... Yeah, and, you know, the, the guy, after he's done the, the performance, he, like, turns and says, so that's why. And we have, you know, the delivery man rushes away from there, and they do one of those sped-up film gags. Where, you know, he, he gets on the, the motorcycle and rushes away from there, and the film is sped up, and he gets into a mechanic, and the mechanic starts acting like the guy is a car, like, he's, like, you know, washing down his face as if it's like a windshield and such. And they, yeah, and he says, you know, he, he explains the situation. And he says, oh, I've got solution, I've got a cure, and it's Calypso music. And, and it cuts and reveals there's like a couple dozen people listening to them playing. 
which is probably more gratif a more gratifying experience as you're performing music than just doing it in front of cameras and crew. Considering how many of the performances in this are big stars and many of them getting very little screen time, the delivery man certainly does get a lot of screen time. I, I really don't know. I don't think he's the biggest name from the... Yeah, anyway. And an hour and five minutes in, more dancing girls, more toplessness. And then there's a scene, and, and this is this is probably the most well remembered from you know if if you watched it many years ago and you remember one thing, this is probably the scene. Kilpitas and Antipesa are preparing the set with like is it just called wallpapering? I I honestly don't know, but yeah, you know, put in they're they're applying glue to the back of the wallpaper and trying to put the wallpaper. And now we are definitely in Laurel and Hardy territory. It is... <sighs> yeah, there's not a lot. If, if you've seen Laurel and Hardy, it's one of those things. I, I don't know if it's comparable to the Three Stooges. I've never watched very much of that. But Laurel and Hardy, yeah, imagine them making a mess out of trying to apply wallpaper and, and paint something paint a room, you know, yeah, and yeah, so after the two writers completely destroy the set, you know, they've both got paint and wallpaper glue on their hands and faces and such, the director comes in and gets really upset when he sees it, so they start, you know, shaking his hand and, uh, like, you know, giving him a reassuring hug and such, getting the stuff all over him as well, and then he screams, get out, and yeah, it's... And and Kilpita talks to a vagabond about old, you know, about what he likes to see in movies, and he says, "Oh, I love, you know, I miss back when it was, you know, silent movies." So we see some parody of old silent movies, but it does look like it was made when they made this movie, rather than that they found old footage. And Stompy appears, who's basically like. I, f I forget, Rube Goldberg, was that a person, or is that part of someone's name? Anyway, Storm P. P. I think Storm Peterson was his real full name, did a lot of drawings of Rube Goldberg machines. And it's been less than 10 minutes since there was last, you know, bare-legged women dancing, but apparently someone felt that was entirely too much. And finally, the movie, sorry, that sounds like it, it wasn't like a, a big relief, but the final scene of the movie is that the two writers and the director walk in to, you know, talk to the, the company owner, and they're like laughing about what the movie is, and, and he's like, what are, you, what are you laughing at? And then they're like, oh, the, the movie idea, and then he starts laughing, and they're like, what are you laughing at? And it's... And, and then they, they realize that he's laughing about the movie. Then they start laughing, and he gets annoyed. And they explain the movie to him, cobbling together all of these hugely, like, completely dissonant ideas that they got from all of the different audience members. And honestly, you know, several one-off jokes are included. Like, they bring up like a, a brief line by one of the sailors I, I think it was yeah that like he's like oh yeah sure you know he, he orders from the waiter after they say you know I it's possible that you while watching the movie already forgot that there was a sailor in this anyway the the yeah you know the sailors were like two beers for each so the guy you know I think Kelpitas and I think it was turns to the waiter and says four beers, one water. And so one of the sailors says, what's with the water? Let me think. Yeah, I honestly don't know what it's called. Like, yeah, I'm just going to slightly rephrase. Do you have a plant in your stomach? That's brought back in, in this final sum up. And like, by then, it's been like 
over an hour, and it wasn't like a big deal that they kept bringing back. It was a one-off line that, and yeah, it's possible that they had a little bit, you know, and it's not like the most memorable thing about the movie either, but it's, yes, you know, I can imagine this played way better back when this was new and people were distracted by a million things on the internet. Today, you really have to apply yourself to remember all of these things, some of which, again, haven't been mentioned for over an hour. Since I've watched this maybe a dozen times or more, I remember, but the first, you know, Pepperidge Farm remembers, but the first time you watch this, you might not be able to. And, yeah, the, the, let's see. Yeah, the, the first time I watched it, I probably didn't remember all the jokes. And I think also back then I probably said, I don't remember that. What does that mean or something? And my father explained it to me. And so the next time I watched it, I remembered, oh, so that's that thing that they mentioned at the end. And yeah, it's, it's definitely something that if you enjoy it, the, you know, you may have to watch it more than once in order to, to, to pick up absolutely everything for that final, you know, but yeah. So the, yeah, 78 minutes without credits, without any credits, 80 minutes long with them now. Okay. So. Did I actually end up putting it? I did not end up putting anything in the second section. So we're just gonna, we're gonna skip the third section. Critics, sites, IMDb, and Wikipedia. Okay, so I spent almost an hour talking about the, yeah, giving a sum up of the movie and that's yeah so not that far off from how long the movie actually is okay so here yeah I copied in my old written review from 2010 which I think is actually the only IMDB review of it so that's how little known it is you know IMDB like has not been around since like before the year 2000, like it was, I think, I think it was one of the fairly early websites that came up online. So in, in 20 some years, nobody else has went and just reviewed it. You know, you don't even have to, I, I forget if they still have that rule about you have to write in like 10 lines or 10 words. I don't remember what it is. You know, it's free. It only costs time nobody else has so that tells you how few people you know still care about it so let's see it does have a number of yeah i'll, I'll get into the the uh, how it's been voted by imdb users honestly i think i'll probably maybe i'll just go ahead and yeah, I think I'll just read some of this. I suppose I get the negative votes. This isn't what people like today. And yes, most of it is silly and goofy. There are things that fit in nowhere and are completely random. It's by no means a masterpiece. And it isn't a flick that makes a lasting impression. The basic idea is that you see the two writers and the director asking members of the very different groups, age, job, gender, what they want in a movie. And then we see it. Am I the only one who gets a kick out of how meta this is? Or representation of, oh, right, the, yeah, here I said the dolls become French chicks doing the can and can, presumably, because they can, can, can. Was that what it was supposed to be? Wasn't it that... I think I might have misremembered. Didn't I write the review right after? Maybe I was trying to make it make more sense, but... No, because it wasn't right after she talked about the dolls. It was right after the... The first dancing bit was right after the sailor showed that he had a tattoo of a woman on his stomach. And anyway, yes, that means that some of what we see was put into this purely because it was popular at the time. With that said, nearly none of that is dated or out of style. They include jazz, calypso, and songs that were everywhere at the time. Catchy tunes that will take years to excise from your brain. I'm not kidding. One of them. I literally thought, oh, I remember this being stuck in my head, and is 
has been ages since I watched this. So I just gotta, yeah, it says the you know high CPU usage, but there's not really anything I can do about that. And it is still running the stream. So anyway, it is more than likely that this originated as the filmmakers trying desperately to think of what to put in the thing. This is, well, when it was made, not, now it really shows because tastes have changed. As audience pleasing as the fictional picture they're putting together, there are gags and jokes that fall flat. But almost without exception, the scenes are immensely short, so you barely have time to tire of anything. You have to play, pay close attention to get every punchline, and it isn't always worth it. Everything flies by fast, and next to nothing in this overstates its welcome. Of course, that doesn't help if you aren't laughing. It's not as painful as the green elevator. The humor can be funny, even sharp and observant, as well as naughty, though children won't get it. Farcical parody and over the top, that goes to the performances too. It's all swift and delivered. This has 32 known actors from the period in big and small parts. Usually they appear once in this. It's enjoyable to recognize them, and this is surely entirely harmless. Yuck and Peterson have strong moments. It is if the best of their careers is large elsewhere. If you view just a few minutes of this, try to make it the sequence of them constructing a set near the end. This also has worked as a time capsule. You can see stuff from back then, how things were, how people talked, behaved. For crying out loud, there's footage of Stompy in this. There's brief nudity in this. I recommend it to anyone who likes our comedies of the time and those who are nostalgic about the period. And I gave it a 6 out of 10. So there is nothing on Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic about this. And yeah. I mean, there are some somewhat obscure things on there, but anyway. So, IMDb, so the, yeah, there are no taglines. I feel like this is kind of excessively, this has a 4.1 of 10 on IMDb. It's nowhere near that. I, if I, I wouldn't give it less than a 6, personally. It's only 38 user votes. So, three people gave it a 10. I could understand that. If you absolutely love it, I can understand seeing. Yeah. One person gave it an 8. Three gave it a 6. Five gave it a 5. Ten gave it a 4. Seven gave it a 3. Six gave it a 2. And three gave it a 1. So, that's why it's so low. Yeah. And, right, so, let's see, right, so the IMDb trivia, oh, so I guess that's where it's from, okay, when first released, the running time was 99 minutes, subsequent releases on TV, video, and DVD typically only runs 79 minutes, so I guess that's why the VHS copy has the wrong, they thought it was the longer version. Maybe they looked up what it was supposed, how long it was supposed to be, not realizing that this version was cut down from that. So, let's see. Yeah, and it's only, it it's, it's featured in a TV movie about Dieppe Pass, on, just simply called Dieppe Pass from 1990, from 1990. And, okay, so there's a show, Stolwa Danska, so Great Danes. Although that doesn't even mean that in the, yeah, the, it's actually hilarious. Great Dane is also the name of a dog breed, but in Danish, we don't even use a Danish word for it. We call it Grand Danois, which is French for Great Dane. So, if, yeah, that's, that's, there's some reason for that, but I've forgotten. I, yeah, that's, uh, anyway. No, when they called the show Great Danes, that doesn't mean the dog in, in Danish. Anyway, they did an episode, apparently, on Dieppe Pass in 2005, and, yeah, in both of those, they have footage of, yeah. Okay, so, 
let's see, what is, is this a, huh, I forgot where I found this, but yeah, synopsis, I'm just going to read a lot of this, Dirk Passer, Kirk Peterson, Peyton Nierko, that's what, that's the guy who plays the director, that's right. Interview people on the street who come with wishes about what they want to see on film. It all turns out to be a best of theatrical stage performances from the past years. There is no Danish Wikipedia entry for the film. I seriously, people, where is the love for this? It's not some masterpiece, but it's not... It shouldn't be this forgotten. I seriously hope someone watches this video and either they're like, oh, I remember that. I could do with watching that again. Or they're like, that sounds like something I might watch. You know, they're not paying me to... Like I said, I don't even know if you could get this on DVD. Although I could honestly, if you live in Denmark, blockbuster.dk, I want to say it is, is a streaming service. It's, it's, I think it's basically like Netflix. I've never used Netflix, so I don't know for sure. Except you pay for each individual. There's no monthly charge. So if you don't watch very much, you're not going to be charged very much. Where with Netflix, you can watch as much as you want, and you'll be charged the same. Which is why I'm never getting one, because I would get super neurotic about, you know, no matter what I'm doing, I feel like, I should be watching Netflix because every moment of every day that I'm not watching Netflix, I'm paying for something that I'm not using. So, I Blockbuster DK might well have it. I I think that's a distinct possibility. I'm not. They're not paying me for for this. But if you think you might enjoy it, I mean, I I really people. Something like The Room has far more attention than this does, and that is far more ineptly made. I think I've never, I never have watched that. I don't, I don't really seek out movies that are advertised as being so bad it's good. I don't really, anyway, if you like it, more power to you. I'm not, I don't have any problem with that. It's just not for me. I... I have way more interest in something that's well made, even if the standards have changed so much that it's no longer seen as particularly appealing, like this. So, but, yeah, this, yeah, this, this, I believe, is the, the English Wikipedia page for it. So, it barely has, yeah, okay, so it's got some of the names of the people... Okay, here we go. Beverly Hay is a 1956 Danish comedy film directed by Jens Henriksen. Wait, it was actually directed by... Wait, so the actual director plays the direct... Okay, that's... Yeah, that's meta. Yeah, and it lists the different people playing the different characters and let's see. Boy is listed as guest who talks too much. And yeah, there's not really anything super interesting in the you know what yeah some of these are slightly amusing Bigger Reimer's wife who acts as a housekeeper is a woman who calls for the police that's that's it I knew I had seen her somewhere anyway woman uh, during hospital visitation I guess it's called and, yeah, so sometimes when there's very little stuff online for me to talk about in a video, I copy into the, the notes 
review, you know, external reviews that you find on IMDb, which I'm, I really appreciate that they do. I don't think there was, I think there was only one, but, and I don't know how much of this, this person really didn't like it. The, yeah, so I'm just gonna, Yeah, so basically, I seriously, this this reviewer says that the wallpapering scene isn't even a little funny. I, I do not know. I, yeah, I, I don't know how to each their own. I just don't understand how anyone... And this is a, a Danish person, and it seems as though he's watched other movies, other Danish comedies from the time. But he also does say that he doesn't like those either, so, I don't know. Again, it's not a masterpiece, but it's way better than he makes it sound. Anyway, and, but he does correctly list that it's 80 minutes. And I think this is a different... I really should have made that clearer. Or... No, maybe it is the same one. Anyway. Yeah, the only IMDb review is my own. And that actually... Yeah, that's that's everything. This was 16 pages in Microsoft Word. For comparison, other times I've had 100... I think an upcoming one... There's almost 250, which I think is also around the, the limit. And that's the one where it gets to be like, I don't know, four or five hours sometimes of, of video. But yeah, this was very... I guess I pretty much said everything I really wanted to. Let me see if there's anything left from the VHS cover that I wanted to... I mean, it got good newspaper reviews back when it came out. I think these are from when it came out. Yeah, it's, it seems like... Yeah, this is people who watched in the theater. Yeah, I'm just going to read it aloud. It may become necessary to subtitle some of the scenes because the laughter was so noisy that there was shushing and I think that pretty well yeah I, I don't really have anything I don't know what this says about it I, again I try not to show the cover in these videos because I learned the hard way that that really screws up the autofocus. Sometimes I do it at the end of videos, but this time I'm not even going to do that. <sighs> yeah, the what they sell this on, I think this might be the original poster that they simply put on the cover of the VHS. It's it's the faces of Dear Pass and Kirpidos and with their names, and then Standing in between them is one of the dancing girls, or rather a drawing of it, of one of the, sorry, of them, of one of the dancing girls. So that was what they were selling it on. And then it says, you know, 32 popular actors and such. But, yeah, the, and it actually it has... On the back of it, there's three promotional shots that are very, I guess, okay, maybe this one is a frame from the movie, but the other two are decidedly not. Because the one with the guy and the, yeah, the, the one of them is the, the 
the two women in the in the hospital room and in the in this promotional picture you can see the the yeah ba basically they took several elements that in the actual sketch are seen separately from each other and they combined them into one which is of course not a novel thing for a promotional picture picture yeah i guess that covers it i'm really glad i already had planned to do another video today or this would feel I, I know for for a lot of people maybe most people this is a long video for me it's very very short but yes that absolutely covers it so I do hope that this you know what if if you watch this and you were like maybe this would be something and because you know f through hearing me describe some of it you changed your mind and you figured you're not gonna that's great I don't want anyone to waste their time that's why I've been so careful to describe instead of usually I make videos based on the notion that someone had not always but some more most of my more recent videos are based on the idea that you've already watched the thing I'm talking about so you know what I'm commenting on. It's only my specific comments that are completely new to you, but for this, yeah, I, I do hope that I helped you make the decision either way. I hope that I was sufficiently clear that no one has sat through this whole thing thinking that it wasn't as obscure as... Oh no, there's no way that I've mentioned when it was from and what it is enough times, that there's no way but yeah, I, I really hope that someone watches this video and remembers about this movie because it's, I really don't feel... If The Room doesn't deserve to be forgotten, this movie definitely doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Way more competency and effort was put into this. I'm sorry, I know maybe I'm old-fashioned like that, but I do have more respect for effort and competency than accidentally making something that's enjoyable. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.